G'day, I'm Paul. So that is the Porsche Taycan. Well, it's the off-road version, the Cross Turismo. Um, I actually joined Porsche like ages ago during the development of this car in Germany. They were still sort of figuring out all the stuff behind it and uh, we got to sort of experience it and all that sort of thing. But it meant that I didn't get to drive it until right now. So I'm really excited to see what this is like. This one right here is the Turbo specification. So one down from the Turbo S. It's priced at a little under $300,000. If that's too expensive though, the entire Taycan range kicks off at under 200 grand. Now, in terms of the competitors, uh, this doesn't really have any competitors. The rest of its competitors are, are SUVs. This is more like a wagon shooting brake style thing. So it's in a segment of its own right now. Today, we're going to do a detailed review of this car. So if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of the review, you can use the time codes up on the screen there. Or if you're on YouTube, you can scroll down and there's chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. That way you'll find out every single time I tell you my life story. Righto, let's talk about the design. You have 17 colors to pick from. Most of them are free of charge. There are a few that cost five grand. This is one of them. It's like an off-white color. You can also get colors to match. So if you have a favorite, I don't know, shoe or something like that, you can get them to match that color and that will cost you about $20,000. What do you think about the design? I'll tell you what, this looks bloody awesome in person. I, I, yeah, it just has so much presence about it and I think this color combo is cool. Normally press cars are just really boring, but they've just been really adventurous with this. So let's have a look down the front here. So big Porsche logo just here. I like with these headlights, how they're nice and sleek and sort of tucked into that undercarriage area just there. Down the bottom here, you've got a pretty complex array of things. You've got a camera down there for the 360 camera, radar off to the side, and then you've got this uh, sort of, I don't even think it's body colored. It's like a silver color by the looks of it uh, that offsets with the body color and then these black highlights. Now being an EV, I've mentioned this in a few other EV reviews, they don't really need cooling here at the top end. It's more down the bottom here that they need cooling for the battery system. So this is all pretty modest there in terms of those requirements. In terms of the headlights themselves, the turbo comes with matrix LED headlights and then LED daytime running lights. You can see that cluster there. You can always tell when a Taycan's coming towards you because it has that sort of uh, quite a unique headlight arrangement. Off to the side here, you've got these vents that funnel through to the outer edges of that tire. And if we come around to here, look at these wheels. So it comes standard with 20 inch alloy wheels, but this has an optional 21 inch alloy wheel. And this also has the optional body colored wheels as well. I think it just looks sensational. It's quite a daring design, but I think they've pulled it off beautifully here. In terms of the brakes, six piston calipers, 410 mil rotor at the front here. So it is a meaty brake setup. It is a fairly heavy car, so you need to be able to pull up nicely. Now, white brake calipers, what does that mean? You can option this with carbon ceramic brakes. This has the standard steel brake package, but it has a ceramic coating on it. And that's why they look slightly different to the standard brake you'd find in any other car. That prevents uh, that sort of rusty look you see building up on these. Given that you don't use the brakes as often in an EV, they can be more susceptible to, to that sort of, uh, sort of faded appearance. Whereas this setup here prevents that from happening. It also produces less brake dust as well, which is very essential on a white wheel. So because it is the off-road version, you've got these uh, sort of cladding areas on the wheel arches. Uh, you know, when I say off-road, it's not really that off-road. In terms of ground clearance, it's 148 millimetres, which is 20 mil higher than a regular Taycan. And then you can also get uh, like an off-road appearance package, which jacks it up an extra 10 mil. You also have air suspension that allows it to go up even higher by around 30 millimetres. So you're not going to be doing any off-roading, but you know, you've got that set up if you need it. I'll run you through this a little bit later on, but it has two of these, they're charging ports. Over on the wing mirror, you have body color, camera built into that. Now you don't see any indicator in this wing mirror. That's because it is located down there on the front guard. I do like here as well that you've got these sort of uh, faux vent segments behind the door there to kind of give it a sporty appearance. This car's optioned with the panoramic roof. You've got these uh, silver colored roof rails, privacy glass, and then come around to the back. Check out this design. So I think this boot is going to be fairly useless because it, it kind of wraps around to the side there. But I think from a design point of view, this looks sensational. You've got that LED strip that runs along the back there. You have the Porsche lettering behind this Perspex panel and then Taycan Turbo as well. And they've discreetly put the button here to open the tailgate. So I think it is just a really nice looking design. And have a look at the height of it. So around that 185 centimeter mark, and you can see here that 
This is a pretty sleek and low car despite being the off-road version. So uh, let me know what you think about the design in the comments section below. I personally think it looks sensational. Have you seen one in person? Do you like them as much in person? Let me know down there. Now let's quickly talk about charging. So this is really interesting. So you've got two charge ports, one on this side, one on that side. They're both the same except this one does DC charging. Now this is an electric charge port and look, you wipe it there and it opens up and you think to yourself, oh, you know, whatever. But one of the engineering complications with this was during winter, especially in areas where it is snowing, that can freeze over. And if you can't open that, you can't charge the car. So they had to actually develop a motor in there that's capable of breaking ice. So it's actually quite a powerful little setup. So don't take that for granted. So you have AC and DC charging. AC charging works at three phase at up to 11 kilowatts, but you can get a larger AC charger that will do up to 22 kilowatts on three phase, which is pretty awesome. Down the bottom here, you've got DC. This is capable of 350 kilowatts at 800 volts, but at the moment they're reaching peaks of about 260 kilowatts during charging. That is pretty impressive because 800 volts, 260 kilowatts, this means it'll charge to that sort of 80% marker in about sort of 18 minutes, which is I reckon pretty impressive and about where it needs to be for an EV. So really cool setup and it means that you can easily access these ports regardless of where you're parked. So I do love the fact that they've given you the option of having both of those. Unfortunately, this is the only side with DC charging on it. So as a battery capacity, it's around 90 kilowatt hours with a usable at around 80 kilowatt hours. So decent battery size and that will give you around 425 kilometers of range. So we are inside the Taycan. Um, before we get stuck into all this, let's start off with the key. So here it is you've got the Porsche logo up the top unlock lock front boot rear boot and then around here it is blank this is a proximity sensing key so you just leave that in your pocket and uh, the door handles then pop out and inside the car you go this can also be optioned in the car's color so that's what they've done here so it matches the exterior of the vehicle once you're inside you have a push button start over here and then you are good to go. Let's talk about this interior. Um, there's kind of a lot to, to talk about here. Uh, I'll get to these in a second, the sort of litany of screens, but just in terms of the design, this looks very uh, traditional Porsche. This is obviously based on the platform that the Panamera is based on, and that means that you are getting a very similar appearance, but they have very much given this all of the tech that the Panamera doesn't get. So I really love the way that this is all recessed back a little bit further. You've got this giant screen up the front here you've got this floating screen down the center with storage beneath it really does look quite nice it is a little bit bland here in just all black i really don't like the piano black on that side as well but you can go to town on colors inside the cabin so if black isn't your uh cup of tea you can then just change this up to make it look exactly how you want it to look now up the top there you'll notice the sport chrono clock uh, sport chrono is interesting because in the internal combustion Porsches it adds uh, like dynamic engine mounts and uh, other bits and pieces including the sport plus button here obviously you don't have dynamic engine mounts uh, but they do add the sport plus feature uh, which kind of changes the driving characteristics and it also adds the clock. I would just pay for Sport Chrono just for the clock. Just look at that. It is just mm, absolutely stunning. Now, in terms of the materials, I really like what they've done here. So it appears like it's leather. I think it's leather sort of throughout the cabin here along the dashboard. They've even got Alcantara right up along the top here as well. So it's really nice and well thought out. The only thing is this appears to be plastic up here. So for some reason they stopped the leather there and this is all just like really hard plastic. Now what about your touch points? So in the center here, it's a bit firm. Uh, likewise, the door, how firm is it? Well, we've got our durometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you wanna see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description. Now, what about build quality? So this is genuinely so damn solid. Um, yeah, one of the, the reasons you're gonna buy this over a Tesla is because you want it to be built properly and they certainly haven't taken any chances here. Everything is nicely screwed together. What about your door? Let's have a listen. Sounds really nice and solid. Okay, let's talk about infotainment. Uh, you guys know that I love my technology and this car is absolutely loaded with it. Uh, I also don't like flies, which is why we have this random setup now. We were just getting bombarded by them. So anyway, let's talk about the infotainment system. So there are a number of screens here. I'll run you through them all. So the main infotainment system is a 10.9 inch display, but you'll notice there's another display just next to it. 
That is the optional passenger display. So it effectively mimics what you have here, but the passenger can control it. There are some functions that don't work on the passenger display that do work here, but for the most part, you can kind of do everything you can do here over there. Look, I love it. It's, it's cool. It's something different, but I reckon it's just a bit of a novelty. If you are buying one of these, I probably wouldn't bother optioning that because it's going to use more battery and it's kind of redundant and it's something for kids to play with and, and just you know, change settings and stuff, which kind of irritates me, but um, so th that's what that screen does. Down here, you've got a climate screen. This allows you to also control the main infotainment screen. So while you are driving, instead of having to click on here and do all this sort of stuff, you can actually access shortcut menus using this. And then using this pad down the bottom, you can then click on the things you need to click on. So really not a bad setup, and they've definitely thought about the functionality of how all this works. Uh, in terms of the features you get on that main infotainment system, you've got AM, FM, DAB+, digital radio, and that's all ported through a 14-speaker Bose-branded sound system. It is a cracking sound system, so big thumbs up on that. You also have smartphone mirroring. Now, one of our viewers got a little bit cranky because I keep calling it smartphone mirroring, but apparently it's not that. So let me know if that annoys you and I'll call it something different. But smartphone mirroring is effectively the smartphone connection you have that displays on the screen here. Apple CarPlay is wireless. I'll show you what that looks like. So there it is there, pretty much a full screen display. Really nice and fast as well and fairly sharp too, which is always nice to see. Now, I can't show you what Android Auto looks like because it's not fitted to this car, but it is available on Taycan. So if you are buying one, just make sure you have the correct version of PCM, which is PCM6. That comes with Android Auto. So if you have your heart set on that, just make sure it's got it. In terms of other features, this is also where you're able to change all of the car's settings, all the drive modes. Um, it is quite a comprehensive setup. Now, let's run through the screen ahead of the driver. Look how big it is. So it goes from here to here, something like 17 inches in terms of size, and it is really high resolution and curved as well. So from a technology standpoint, this is a really impressive setup. The good news is you can uh, configure virtually anything here. So you can change the way that everything looks uh, in terms of the displays. You can change what is sitting on each display. Uh, it, it really just has an unlimited amount of configurability. So uh, I like the way that they've allowed you to do everything here. You'll notice on the sides as well, this is where they've mounted some of the buttons and it's just a good way to move things away from the dashboard and it's a clever use of space. So really impressed with all of this. And finally, ahead of the driver, you have a head up display. It's pretty basic, but it gives you all the information that you need. Now let's talk about safety tech. So you've got autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian detection. You have a lane departure warning and a lane keeping assistant. Radar cruise control, blind spot monitoring built into that wing mirror. There is also front and rear parking sensors and a 360 degree camera. I'll show you what that looks like. There it is there. Um, it's not the best camera in the world. It's actually quite poor. I'm surprised they haven't gone with a high resolution camera. The 360 cam looks okay, but it just seems for some reason that the, the sort of view around the car and also the rear view just really isn't that impressive, which is a bit of a shame, I reckon. Um, there is an automatic parking feature though. So if you're not confident with parking, one hit of that will get you sorted. Now let's talk about practicality and we'll start off with your connectivity. So inside the glove box here, you've got two USB-C ports and a 12 volt outlet. There is a phone pouch in there, but no wireless phone charging. You have to option that, which is a little bit disappointing. I would have thought it'd be standard in a car like this. In terms of storing your phone, you have plenty of places. So you can wake it there, you can pop it down here if you want or put it in the glove box. Okay, coffee drinkers. If you're like me and you have this little baby sized coffee cup, look, it, it holds it in, but the problem is it drops all the way in. So when you go to get your coffee out, you can't actually grab it. You sort of run the risk of it spilling everywhere. So uh, I basically just use my house keys or the car key to prop it up and then it can wedge in there. And then on other bottle storage, you can whack your bottle inside this and it really holds it in nicely with those teeth. This also fits inside the door. Let's try our big bottle. Let's see if that'll go anywhere here. Uh, doesn't fit in there. I'll try it inside the door. It fits inside the door though, which is pretty cool. Other storage, you have a center console here. It's not the biggest in the world. In fact, it's quite small. The other annoying thing is it doesn't stay up. So when you're trying to get something out of it, it sort of keeps falling back down. So you need to hold it up yourself. And then you've got a glove box down here. Um, unfortunately, it's comically small. You really can't fit anything. Uh, these are my sunglasses. And for an example, this barely fits in here. So when I go to put them in, it kind of crushes it 
it when it closes it because they also don't fit in here. So well, yeah, it's a little bit disappointing there isn't more practical storage space inside the car. Now let's talk about comfort. So you have four zone automatic climate control. So you activate that using this panel up here. It's an interesting screen because it has capacitive touch. So when you push some of these buttons, you can feel it responding as you go through, which is cool. Heated and cooled seats. This car has 14 way power adjustable seats. So you can go forwards, backwards, backrest can go forwards, backwards. You can lift the front, you can lift the back. You can adjust your side bolsters. You can roll this bottom section of the seat out. And then you also have your back bolsters as well. You've got seat memory on the door there for both driver and front passenger. Seats themselves are pretty cool, like they've got these perforations in them, big Porsche crest up the top there, and they hug you in really nicely. So it's exactly what you want from a car that's going to be going quite fast. The steering offers electric adjustments so that goes up and down, in and out. You also have steering wheel heating. There's a little button stuck just under here, and that allows you to heat the steering wheel on cold mornings. And then on our reach test, all of this stuff is easy to reach. It is easy to reach there as well. It just becomes harder to reach if you're over on this side of the screen, but you've got this shortcut pad to reach everything that you need on that side of the screen. So second row of the Taycan. Are you surprised at the amount of room there is here? Because I certainly am. Uh, knee room is okay. Toe room is pretty reasonable. Headroom is good as well. But it feels a little bit cramped for such a you know, it does look big on the outside. It does feel cramped inside, which is a little bit disappointing. I was hoping there'd be a bit more room to stretch out here. The other thing I find strange as well is that this is an electric car. It does not need a driveline tunnel down the centre. So I don't know if this is a hangover from the Panamera platform or what the reason for that is. But yeah, I just don't like the fact that um, there is a hump there. That should really just be flat if the batteries are mounted to the floor. I don't know if the batteries actually sit within this area as well. In terms of your comfort, you have your third and fourth zone of climate control down here, and that's all controlled on this screen. You will notice that when you flick through those menus, you'll find a little secret here. And that's something I forgot to mention up the front there. All of your vents are controlled electronically. So you move this little doodad around here and it will adjust the vent so you don't actually have any manual adjustment for those vents which I think is something novel and a little bit interesting. You've also got heated seats for the two outboard seats. Back here you've got two USB-C ports, a little storage area just there, no map pockets. You've got two isofix points on the outboard seats along with top tether points as well. Centre armrest here with two cup holders, we'll try a bottle in there. Fits in no dramas, you've got little teeth there as well and we'll see if it fits in the door. Yes, no dramas there at all. Got a little divider here that drops down to let you get access to the boot. And finally, our window test. Let's see if that window goes all the way down. No, it doesn't. You get this awkwardly narrow opening in the back here. So I mentioned before, doesn't look like there's gonna be a whole deal of cargo space. So you push that to crack the boot open. And look, I'm kind of right. There is just over 400 litres of cargo space available there. Underneath the cargo floor is where you can store some of your cables. This car has the optional 22 kilowatt AC charging system. So you can see some of the three phase cables are tucked under here as well. There is also a bigger uh, box as well that you cart around with you if you need to. So at least you really do need to continuously charge. I'd probably leave all that stuff at home. Now in terms of your storage, off to the side here, you've got a couple of storage holes. You've got a 12 volt outlet there. A couple of hooks as well. These uh, straps on the side. Now, let me show you the boot space before I expand it because if that's not big enough, it actually isn't too bad once you expand it. So this is what it's like with our bags in there. So more than enough room to fit a mid-sized suitcase, laptop bag, whatever else you need. Then what you can do is drop the second row. Unfortunately, you can't do that from here. You've got to go around to the sides. Once you've done that, you have a little over 1,100 litres of cargo space available. I almost forgot there's about 100 litres of cargo space in the front boot as well. So we've hit the road in the Taycan. There is a little bit to get through here, so just bear with me while I explain it all. Now the Taycan Turbo comes with two electric motors. You've got one that services the front axle, one that services the rear axle. They are around 335 kilowatts of power for the rear motor and around 175 kilowatts for the front motor. So both of those combined can produce up to 500 kilowatts of power with overboost. And that also plums up to 850 Newton meters of torque, which is pretty mental stuff. Now, what does all that 
that feel like behind the wheel? Well, it's interesting because it depends where you are in the rev band because when you're right down low in the rev band, there's actually a two-speed transmission here. It's unique to the Taycan because it's not something you generally see in EVs because you don't really need a transmission when it comes to driving one of these. You just have one gear and then it covers the entire band of acceleration. But to make the Taycan as quick as it is, the two-speed transmission takes care of rapid thrust and acceleration at low speeds with a really short gear, and then a wider gear for speeds while you're moving. So that means if you are on the autobahn doing 150 k's an hour and you plant the throttle, this is able to then pick up and start hammering along. A lot of other EVs, once they are up and moving, don't really have that acceleration once they're, they're already sort of on the move. So if I plant the foot, <laughs> it pins me back into the seat and away we go. So it does all of that fun stuff that an EV does. Uh, it just feels absolutely mental when it takes off. And I'll show you what that looks like when we do our little launch control run. But behind the wheel, you do have a lot of flexibility here in terms of the drive mode. So we're currently in normal mode. And in normal mode, it's able to just give you sort of soft and gentle acceleration, even up to the point where you've reached almost full throttle. If you do go hard enough, it will then kind of reach its overboost mode, pin you back in the seat, and then away it goes. But you do have other drive modes to play with here. So you have uh, range, which extends the range by uh, reducing air conditioning, limiting your maximum speed to 140 k's an hour, bringing the car down a little bit in terms of its ride height. You've got normal, sport, sport plus, and individual, and they all sort of cater for different types of driving environments. Now, what does all that mean in terms of efficiency? So unlike a Tesla where they try and aim for efficiency and power, Porsche is doing what Porsche does. They've said, this is a fast car, it's not going to be efficient. And as a result of that, you have an official electric economy of 28.6 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. That is, it uses 28.6 kilowatt hours of electricity per 100 kilometers. And given it's around an 80-ish kilowatt hour battery, you can see how many k's of range that you get. What are we achieving though? So if we go up here to trip, we're currently sitting on 25.7. So you don't see that often. We're using less electricity than the claim. And it's kind of typical of Porsche because when they do their zero to 100 times, they uh, kind of fib a little bit. They're always quicker in real life. And I think here with the economy, they've done the exact same thing. Porsche claims a 0 to 100 time of 3.3 seconds. This is how it went up against our stopwatch. Now, have a look at this little screen down here. We're only going around a light corner here, but this car has what Porsche calls uh, Dynamic Chassis Control Sport. And that's a 48 volt system that interacts with the anti-roll bar to stiffen up the side of the car that has most of the load on it. And in effect, it gives you a completely flat driving experience through a corner. And that little screen there will tell you how much load there is on it as you sort of drive it faster. And speaking of which, let's pop this into Sport Plus now. Hear that sound? There's a speaker, I'll run you through that in a second, but let's punt it through our corner here. <laughs> The noise is actually really cool. So you can see there that little graphic is lighting up as we oh, get it through that corner. This is the highest speed corner as we roll into it. Again, it's loading up that side of the car. Punch that. Man, this thing is quick. <sighs> Tell you what, you, I'm kind of lost for words because it is accelerating at a really rapid pace. Now, one of the things that Porsche does here, they really lean on the regen program to limit the amount of use you have of those brakes. That means when you do pound on the brake, you're actually using a whole lot of regen before the friction brakes take hold. And it means that you're able to slow down nice and quickly without having to abuse those brakes all the time. And it works pretty well. You don't really notice the transition there between the uh, regen mode and the friction brakes. Man, this car is quick, far out. Whew. <laughs> Jesus. Um, yeah, this feels very different to a Tesla. I don't know, I, I'm using the Tesla as a reference point because the last one that I drove that was fast was a Model S uh, P100D, or, or the performance as it's now known. And it feels fast in a straight line, but it's just not really that good through corners. This is just on another level. And then when you punch the throttle, it's just pinning you back in the seat constantly. There really is uh, no delay, no lag. It just gets up and goes. This is absolutely sensational. And 
extremely addictive. Um, okay, so that sound that we kept hearing there. This car's optioned with, um, I guess, the electric version of a Porsche exhaust system. That means there is a speaker that's emitting sound, so inside the cabin, but also outside the cabin. So you can actually hear it as it zooms past. It sounds like it's going at a billion miles an hour. You can switch that stuff off on the infotainment system, thankfully, because it does sound a little bit cheesy at times, but uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool setup. So what's the ride like? Well, this sits on adaptive dampers with air suspension. It's actually remarkably good when you consider they are 21 inch alloy wheels with low profile tires. And that means that when you are in and around the city where typically these are going to be spending most of their time, it is incredibly smooth. And that even translates out to country roads at highway speeds on the undulations here, which are typical of a country road. So this is a sports car. In theory, it should be not great. So we'll just see how it rounds out these bumps. Yeah, beautiful. No dramas at all, very impressive. There is still some tire noise that comes into the cabin, but for the most part, it's actually quite a pleasant place to be seated. Um, what's visibility like? So look, not terrible. I thought it was going to be a whole lot worse than it is. So down the front there, I can see the corners of the car. The wing mirrors are big enough. They could be maybe just a touch bigger, but they do have a blind spot monitor built into them. Visibility out the rear isn't great. It's a super narrow envelope, but I guess it's okay to see out of if you need to. And then at low speed driving, you have front and rear parking sensors, 360 cameras, so it is pretty easy to park. Now, one thing I'll mention as well is this car has four wheel steering. And what that means is when you're going through these corners, it's able to effectively tuck the car in a little bit. So it has that torque vectoring setup, which actually works a whole lot better on an EV because it's electric and everything is instant. But with the four wheel steering, as I provide steering input, the rear wheels are joining me in that to try and guide the car around the corner with ease. But then at low speeds, it actually helps by decreasing your turning circle. So at low speeds, it goes from 11.7 meters to 11.2 meters, which is uh, a really good sort of reduction in that. And then when you are doing low speeds, the steering is so light, it's fantastic. So it does firm up a little bit in sport plus mode, but at low speeds with that uh, sort of turning circle, it actually makes it quite easy to drive and park in and around the city. Um, one thing I will touch on before we wrap up is the regen braking. Um, in sport mode, it's great because you can really sort of abuse it and there's enough regen braking there to slow the car up as you need to sort of slow up. But in and around the city, it's really unpredictable in terms of how it works. Often when I go for the brake, I'll hear the friction brake working instead of it just using regen. And I don't know, it just seems a bit counterproductive. I'd love to just be able to roll out of the throttle and, and have it use a whole lot more regen. There is um, you know, a button on the steering wheel that helps achieve that, but just doesn't really do an amazing job, I reckon. So the Porsche Taycan. Um, look, I'm gonna preface this by saying that a lot of people that test these cars, a lot of other journalists and stuff like that, they're testing them out on the road and when you compare it to a Tesla, you know, Tesla's got all the latest gadgets and gizmos and stuff. The Model S Plaid is, is faster and all that sort of thing. But we've been fortunate enough to be able to test the Taycan at what was a world-class proving ground at one point developing world-class cars. So it gives us a unique perspective to really stretch the legs of these things. And I can tell you that this handles just so much better than any Tesla I've driven before. And it feels far more confidence inspiring as well. So while it may not be as fast in a straight line as the latest and greatest Tesla Model S, I think this really just has a Porsche vibe to it. And that's what you want from an electric car that wears a Porsche badge. So yeah, it puts a big smile on my face. In terms of things that it could do better, there needs to be more storage space inside. It's just a really cramped interior. And I, I get that it's like a sort of compact sports car type thing, but Look at the size of it, surely you could come up with better storage solution, but I think that's something that can work on. And on the tech front, yeah, I love the second screen and the way that it looks, but I think it's a little bit redundant and I just wouldn't bother wasting money on that kind of thing. But outside of that, it's incredibly sporty, fast, and charges quickly as well. So yeah, it's pretty awesome. Uh, let me know in the comments section below, what do you reckon about the Taycan? Have you bought one? What are you doing with it? And if you have bought one, have you gone crazy with the spec? like the press car is here let me know in the comment section if you did enjoy this video please make sure you like it and share it with your mates and if you haven't done so already subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon that way you'll find out every single time we drive one of these fun little things but until next time take it easy